Okay, so we're picking up the uh, lecture from where we left off last time, or somewhere pretty close to where we left off last time. And we're talking about mechanics. And mechanics is just kind of talking about, okay, how does the reaction take place? So what are the little steps involved in how a reaction takes place? So looking at this, it says, well, it can all happen just as the equation tells us, or there may maybe some unseen steps in a reaction that uh, we can't see and we have to kind of determine experimentally or make some assumptions as far as what's happening. And these are some of uh, some ideas of what could be happening in a reaction. And this first one where A simply turns into product, that's the decomposition reaction. You've seen those before, you're familiar with those. Uh, the second one here where you have A reacting with A something reacting with itself, um, that's bimolecular. Uh, also, which is probably maybe a little more commonly thought of, is you have one substance reacting with another substance producing product, also bimolecular. Uh, these other three down here are less common, and the reason they're less common is because we need three substances to collide with each other, um, proper orientation, proper energy, all at the exact same time and it's just not quite as likely. So yes, they can occur, but again, not quite as likely. Uh, this little graphic here is fine. Um, what it's kind of looking at is say, okay, we have different steps potentially in a reaction. So I could have a slow initial step in which the reactants are kind of bottled up in the beginning. And then they go on to a second step, which is just easy going. So they just go right on through. Or you could have a really fast initial step. And then the substances get bottled up in a second step. And then they slowly work their way through there. So let's take a look at uh, a couple examples. Uh, first one, in which you have an initial slow step. So we have this reaction written here, um, NO2 plus CO producing product. And then we have a rate law. Uh, notice what's missing in the rate law, uh, carbon monoxide, which leads us to believe that it just doesn't matter. doesn't matter how much we have in there. It does not affect the reaction rate at all. So let's take a look at some steps. Um, if we take a look at the steps, uh, notice in the first step, that's the slow one, where you have NO2 reacting with itself to produce a couple of products. And then the NO3 is the substance which uh, reacts in the second step, this time with the CO, um, producing our product. So if we use um, Hess's law and put these guys together, notice that uh, one of the NO2 and the NO2 uh, would kind of cancel, cancel themselves out, and the NO3 and the NO3 would cancel each other out. Uh, the NO3, something that is produced and then consumed in the following step, is called an intermediate. Um, so we don't see NO3 anywhere up in these steps up here, um, but it is something that actually is produced and is consumed later on. Um, so this gets us to our you know, equation which we have listed up above. <clears throat> There's our intermediate. Um, and we mentioned the CO already. All right, for this one, as I'm kind of making a note of, uh, you probably want to break out your book and take a look at page 587. So if you want to pause, go ahead and grab your book and open up to that page. Um, looking at uh, this equation, we have a nice easy equation there, no big deal. And then we look at the rate law. Okay, fine. Uh, the reaction is second order in regards to NO, and it's first order in regards to Br2. So notice that we say that it is ter-molecular. There's three things that have to collide here at the same time. Um, we did mention before that those things are not very common, so we're thinking that it probably happens in a couple of steps. So we said we're saying here that the first step is pretty fast and the second step is slow. So now we can have a discussion about what's going on. Well think about what happens in the first step. 
okay, I'm producing all of this NOBR2. And it's just sitting there. Because this next part of the reaction is very slow. What happens is some, or a lot, of this NLBR2 ends up decomposing and going back into the reactants in which it came from. And then it forms what's called an equilibrium. Doesn't mean they're equal parts of products and reactants from right side to left side. It just means it starts going back and forth at an equal rate. Okay. Um, and then eventually, as it is available, some of this NLBR2 starts to react with the NL and produces the products as we can see. So, yep. Got this. Um, so how do we figure out the concentration of the NLBR2? Fine. And again, having your book handy would be really, really helpful. Um, looking at this, I'm going to go ahead and pause here for a second while I go and grab mine. It's going to be easier for me. Okay, so again, looking at this formula, um, we can see that the NOBR2, as we stated in the previous slide, uh, can do one of two things. It can form um, the products with the NO in the second step, or it can decompose and go back to reactants in which it came from. Um, and eventually, we said, like I said, it forms an equilibrium, which simply means that the rate of the forward is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. Okay, fine. So we have this balance going on here as far as the rate of the forward and the rate of the reverse. And it's showing ex simply that uh, these are the concentrations going in the forward direction. And this is the concentration of the product going in the reverse direction. And if we solve this for NOBR2, all we're doing really is just kind of sliding the A1 over to the other side. And this is what you have on the bottom line there. So this is going to be a substitution that we're going to do here in just a little bit. So here is that equality that we had from the previous slide up here at the top. And if we substitute that in for the second step, then this is what we get. So look at the second step that you have there. And we're substituting all of this stuff up here. See if I can circle it. All of this stuff in the second step for the NLBR2. So we're replacing one with the other. And you get this real nasty looking mess. Well, I guess it's not that nasty, but you get that little mess there. And now we have to try to clear it up. Notice that we have one rate times another rate divided by a third rate. Rate, rate, rate is just a new rate. So if we clean that up a little bit, we have a new rate, um, or rate constant, I was calling it rates. Uh, we have a new rate constant, and the NO and the NO, there's two of them, so that's now second order um, times the BR. Two. And that is done. So real messy, we'll, we'll do an example problem like that. They don't come along that often, but uh, you do need to be aware of it, and you probably will see one or two of them. All right, getting close to the end. Catalyzed reactions. We mentioned this in the very beginning. What a catalyst does is it makes it easier for a reaction to take place because it provides a different mechanism for the reactants to get down to product. So in the end, the most important thing is it requires less activation energy. So the size of that hill or the hump is smaller. Okay, this last slide just kind of looks at the comparison of an enzyme. Um, an enzyme is simply a biological catalyst, so nothing really too fancy there. You guys have seen this before in biology class. Um, that's it. Just kind of does the exact same thing. It lowers the activation energy of a reaction. It makes it proceed more easily. Okay, that's it. We'll get going on more problems, and good luck.